Here we are. Here we are. Setting the clocks back. Set the clocks back. Yeah. <laughs> How are you guys? Uh, happy Monday, November 5th. Coming to you from New York City. The Vagabond Nomad. Call me what you will. How are you guys? You good today? Did you have a great weekend? Did you set your clock back? <laughs> so funny how you just hear that over and over everywhere you go. Set your clock. I mean, most clocks go back automatic now, like on the iPhone and stuff. But yeah, anyway, here we are. Great guest today. A Hall of Famer, a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer is on the podcast today. And I believe he's the fourth. I had Steve Jones, Duff McKagan, Nancy Wilson, and now Mr. David Bryan from Bon Jovi, the keyboard god. And I don't use that word lightly. Keyboard god he is, man. I mean, you got to think, a lot of those Bon Jovi songs... They are all driven by amazing thematic hooky keyboard lines. And this guy, you know, underrated, I think. Underrated when I sit and look at the, uh, the work or listen to the work that he's done over the years. It really is a massive part of the 80s sound and a massive part of the Bon Jovi sound. And uh, without him, I don't think some of the songs would be even close to as strong as they are you know the keyboards really uh bring it in it's funny when i used to play music when i was playing music in the 80s it was always like no keyboards no way and uh later on in life uh, when i played music through the 90s i was like keyboards a must you know you realize if you're not acdc or the ramones you got to get some keyboards in there, man. It really fattens up and gives the music some depth. Look at the Black Crows, man. The Black Crows without Eddie, yeah, they're pretty good, you know. But when Eddie's in there laying down all that stuff, or uh, when you look at the cars, we talk about the cars, uh, David and I today. The cars, a big 80s sound and keyboards. Uh, Bruce with the 70s, of course, and 80s keyboards. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of course, B3. I've talked about it many times. And we can't forget about another king, Ben Montench. Oh, who is also a Hall of Famer. Holy shit. I got like five, maybe more, Hall of Famers on this show, man. I, I, it's funny to think about. Uh, these are heavyweight guests, and David Bryan is definitely a treat for me to talk to him because I like all kinds of music. You know, I like metal, I like country, I like soul, I like R and B. You guys know that if you listen to this show. I love Bon Jovi. I saw him many times early on, and I couldn't believe how fire this band was live. If you could see Bon Jovi around Slippery When Wet and the New Jersey tour, you would be like, oh, my band ain't shit. These guys laid it down, man. And uh, David, big sound. Big, big part of the sound, man. Little Runaway, Wanted Dead or Alive. That whole thing at the beginning of Dead or Alive. Bad Medicine with the clavinet. Even Wild in the Streets with the piano, man. All of these Bon Jovi songs with great, great keyboard hooks. And it was an honor to have him on. I want to thank his daughter, Gabby, for hooking it up. Very cool. And it wouldn't have happened if I wasn't in New York right now. You know, this isn't a, an L.A. guest. It's another great New York guest. And uh, I can't thank David enough for doing it. He came, he came over to where I'm staying. This guy, this guy, is, this guy is rich, man. <laughs> he came over to where I'm staying. He didn't know me. Sat on the couch and we shot the shit about cars, watches, music, Broadway plays, uh, drugs, um, plane crashes. Man, we cover it all. So you're going to love this episode. And uh, after, go back and throw on like New Jersey. Oh, oh, and I forgot to tell, you know, I talk about... Uh, I'll be there for you over and over and over. 
But there's another ballad that they had. I'm such a sucker for ballads. They had another one that was just a monster on uh, Slippery When Wet. And I don't think it got enough glory, but Never Say Goodbye. Wow. What a monster tune. Anyway, they, they got a million tunes. Uh, before I do get into the episode, I want to thank you guys all for uh, donating to Patreon. Thank you, everybody that's tuning in to the bonus episodes. I will release one later today and uh, talk about... Uh, farewell tours, the Queen movie, and uh, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, a uh, couple other things. Yeah, I just I just did a couple cool shows, so I'll be talking about all that stuff on the bonus episodes on Patreon.com/slash Dean Del Rey. Also, if you did try to use the Hair Club, um code last week and you had some problems the the link is working perfect now hairclub.com slash delray for your special del razor discounts go there and get your hair kit hairclub.com slash delray that thing is working now i just want to give you guys a heads up and i also want to give a shout out to whitecovintage.com and give them a congratulations to their brand new actual brick and mortar store open now so go to their website and find out where it is and the hours and everything. It'll be cool to be able to go in and see all those great rock and roll t-shirts in person. Wycovintage.com. They also have uh, some street wear. So they're uh, mixing it up now. So get down with some Wyco and pick up a Queen shirt. Queen. Everybody's all over Queen this week. I'm going to be talking about Queen on the bonus episode. I uh, got a brand new sponsor. A lot of people ask me what I would do if I wasn't doing comedy, and I never sit around and think about that. I'm not a person that's like, what would I do? Because it's what I do, and it's what I love to do. So I think when people ask that, what would you do if you weren't doing such and such? It's like you would only have an answer, I think, if you didn't like what you were doing. But what would I do if I made a bunch of money in comedy? I could answer that. I would probably open up a men's store of clothing and, and a combo of everything. It would be like stereos, watches, clothing, vintage rock shirts. It would be all my favorite shit in one. And um, I was in Denver recently. The reason I bring this up is I was in a killer store, M.W. Reynolds in Denver. This place is unbelievable. It's 1616 Stout Street. And I would call it the Delray Shop because everything in there was what I loved. I, w I walked in there, right? And they had Filson bags, which I love Filson. Absolutely perfect uh backpacks and, and travel bags and duffel bags and everything if you don't know filson uh it's just fantastic stuff so i walk in there they got filson stuff they got shot leathers i'm like what is this store they got bell staff and and uh barber all the greatest men's stuff so I was talking to the guy, and I was like, hey, I'll give you a shout-out on the podcast, man. And he's like, cool. If they want to use the code Delray on checkout, they'll get 20% off. I was like, what? 20% off? That's amazing. So I immediately bought a backpack, a Filson backpack, 20% off. Go to mwreynolds.com and uh, shop and use the code Delray. At checkout, this is perfect for Christmas. I'm telling you, this is the ultimate man store. They had like vintage motorcycles in there, like Triumphs and, and Vincents and stuff. This store was amazing. And the dude is a huge comedy fan. So I was like, oh, this is great, man. Mark Reynolds, the owner, is just a massive comedy fan. So check it out. You don't need to be in Denver. Go to their website, MW reynolds.com and that's r-e-y-n-o-l-d-s.com and uh, or call them up 303-761-0021 now this uh, discount you can only use it once 
and it's for a limited time only. It's uh, it's gonna expire. So if you hear this show two three months from now and it's not working, that's that's why. Anyway, though, just want to give you a heads up, and also you can't use it on uh, sale items, just regular priced items. But pretty cool of the guy to throw out a discount for Dell Razors. Uh, okay, I guess that's about it. I'm going to be at the Comedy Cellar, added a couple more days uh, in Vegas at the Rio Hotel. I am now going to be there Christmas Eve through New Year's Eve. So come visit me there, and I'll be there with Keith Robinson, the two of us there, just fucking having fun Christmas Eve to New Year's Eve. I can't wait. Come on out. Don't forget, one last time, patreon.com slash Delray for your bonus episodes. Here he is right now, a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Mr. David Bryan. All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk today. What a fantastic guest. This is, I believe, my third Rock and Roll Hall of Famer on this show, I think. Maybe the fourth. But introduce yourself, my friend. Wow. Uh, David Bryan here. Bon Jovi, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yeah. this year. Yeah, man. Hall of Fame, dude. Nine years. Nine, we were, nine we were years. We eligible nine years, and then they came to their senses. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the Hall of Fame, it's funny. Um, I had Steve Jones on years ago. Good, This show's been on six and a half years, and he was like maybe the fourth guest. And he broke it down to me, which was really interesting that you guys didn't get in sooner. And I know there's a few different reasons, but what he said was they bring in the people that are going to sell tickets to get them into that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame museum, and then he said they made a gr they make a grip of money and they don't pass out the money to any of the hurting or starving musicians or musicians with no uh, health care or anything. And then all of a sudden it, I started uh, understanding. I was like, wow, OK, I get why you're not into it. You know him himself. But, you know, when you look at the Hall of Fame. People always say every year, oh, I can't believe this band and not that band. And it's like, you can't believe it, really? I mean, it's the music business. Correct. Not just music. It's the business. It's the business. I mean, you look at the... Uh, it's it's always a funny thing. When you're not in it, you're like, ah, that doesn't matter. Ah, that doesn't matter. Yeah, and yeah. then when you're in it, you're like, yeah, that, that matters. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it, definitely. It's a funny thing because you look, I mean, there's... It, it's Elvis. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of rock and roll. So you're kind of in with a pretty heavy crowd. Yeah. And it's definitely political. I think it's becoming less political now. Yeah. But it's definitely, uh, you know, that old guard there that just votes people in. So... We got in, so I can't bitch anymore. No, <laughs> if this can't. was last year, I would have bitched like crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would have been bitching with you. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> How do you sell a hundred million records and not be in the Hall of Fame? Uh, you know, if you look at any kind of sports Hall of Fames, it's all it goes on uh, stats, achievements. And all those you are long in from the first fucking record. Yeah. Hey, listen, we've been doing, you would think, yeah, 130 million records. 130 30 million, million records. records. Uh, and the greatest thing is we're still, we're a current classic. Yeah. I mean, here we are, 30, we started, our first record came out in 84, so 34 years down the road. And we, this house for, is not for sale, our last record was number right. one in 30 countries. And then, you know, top four in another 30 countries on top of those 30 countries. And then to be... To me, I think we're the, the one of the greatest American exports is because we go around the planet singing about rock and roll, an American rock and roll. Yeah. Talking about, you know, everything that America stands for. Yeah, yeah. You, Aerosmith, uh, you know, uh, Springsteen. There's guys out there that... Uh, Still doing it. They transcend uh, over la languages and uh, music styles and everything. And, and time. And keep, time. How the hell time. are we still around? You know, I mean, every band we ever opened up for, yeah. ever played with. You know, we're, we're standing and selling out. And we're, we're going now to uh, the day after Thanksgiving. We fly out uh, to Japan. Yeah. We're doing baseball stadiums there, 65,000 seaters. Wow. Then we go to Australia and do 75,000 seaters. You know, so it's, uh, it's amazing. I think about, but it's funny because if you look at me, I love, you know, heavy music. I love R&B. 
I love soul. And, and, and a lot of times you, you'll get labeled by your look, which I love this show because this show goes all over the board. So somebody would be like, wow, you're a Bon Jovi fan? Huge, huge Bon Jovi fan. In the early days, it really taught me a lot of things about the biz. Great songwriting, amazing stage presence, and uh, it gave me drive and work ethic. You know, the band was constantly working and it's really insane. And I still think to this day that, and I say this over and over, that uh, I'll Be There For You was the greatest song of the 80s as far as a, a rock ballad in my eyes. Well, thank you. Over all of them, Love Bites, uh, Sweet Child of Mine, uh, all the ballads, you know, that you sit and think of uh, Scorpions, uh uh, they had a few. I think back to around 84 when I first see you guys. I saw you guys open for the Scorpions at the Cow Palace, I believe it was, on the 7800 Fahrenheit tour. So that, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, so that's 1985, our second record. Yeah. We came out, I mean, we recorded our first record in 83. Right. Me and John have been playing together since high school. We were high school, I was a junior, and I joined his cover band. Same and, school? Uh, no, I went to, uh, I, my shithole was about an inch up from his shithole. Right. I came from Edison. He came from Saraville. Right. So I went to high school with his cousin, his first cousin. He's like, hey, my cousin's looking for a keyboard player. I'm like, where's he live? It's like Saraville. I'm like, that shithole? Yeah. But my, you know, literally my shithole was an inch. It, it, it did run down. The water ran down. Yeah, yeah. So I joined that band. It was a 10-piece cover band. Whoa. We, we did Springsteen and Jukes, uh, five-piece horn section, five-piece rhythm section, and did, um, and a couple of originals. And at the time, I was playing everything but that. I knew uh, I knew Born to Run, yeah, and I knew we're having a party. So, so John was into Bruce back then. That's what we're from Jersey. I mean, we started in Asbury Park. I get it. I, I understand that. But it really, um, I really don't notice the the Bruce stuff until I'd say the last five years when I go through the catalog. Of course, I know New Jersey. I know that he, the name of the record. And of course, he's into Jersey and he's into Springsteen. But I don't notice it really until recently when I hear like Wild in the Streets. I go, oh, this is a fucking Bruce flavored song. Back then, I didn't know because my mom loved Bruce and I hated him, you know, because it was, bo it was uh, born in the USA era. Oh, yeah. And now I worship Bruce. But back then, I was like, oh, God. So I didn't notice it. But you guys were into it? You know, it was... Once we it was a, it was a cover band because we had a right. we had to make our ten dollars a night or seven bucks a night I think I made in that band it was ten people really so it, was, it was brutal but uh, learned all those songs and then once we started our own world and John was he actually quit the band his own band and I yeah. went wait a minute if you're the lead singer and it's your band and you quit aren't we all fired yeah yeah right. <laughs> I think it's a I go thank you for the soft <laughs> landing there yeah. I think but. We're fucked, you know. Yeah. So he went and he went off to to go start his world of originals because he's like, you know, I want to be in an original band. We're never gonna, you're never gonna go forward in a cover band, right? So I actually went off to school. I yeah, think, you were like, gonna, I'm a Jewish kid, you know. So yeah, I went med and, school, yeah, pre med, and yeah, with and a was, killer like GPA and shit, four point oh, I go into Rutgers, and then I then I wanted to get into Juilliard because I'm a classical piano player. Oh, rad! So I auditioned for that, but I was doing sessions with him at night. And then for Runaway came in, and he wrote that, and I was like, gang, 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 gang. Yeah. I came up with that lick, and uh, we had a record deal from that. Was it his brother or someone in the biz, uncle or something? Cousin. Cousin, he yeah. He owned the power station. Right, right. So we would go in, and we would, he gifted us the four in the morning to eight in the morning time slot, which was wonderful. That's yeah. when everybody recorded, when they're poor. Oh, yeah. They would have those, remember those spec deals? That's Remember where that? we were. Yeah, yeah we were come, right in the, yeah. the the dead zone of nobody wants to be there from four to eight. You come in, you sign this deal, they give you free studio, and then when you get a deal, all of a sudden you got to give them like a hundred grand for that uh, shit. Firstborn, you have to <laughs> give them everything. So we did that, and uh, and then that record came out. But get, so then we went out and toured. We played everywhere on the planet. Yeah, and then we opened up for the Scorpions, our second record. And you were saying before about the Cow Palace. Yeah, that we really learned our work ethic from the scorpions because we opened up for them that's when uh uh love at first thing rocky like a hurricane was that was huge we played six months at five days or six days a week yeah in america and we opened up and we just watched these you know german nazi panzer tank god yeah. every night they were killing it and killing it and killing it 
And we went to the cow pals, love them. I'll never forget the cow pals. Yeah. So we're opening up for them. It's huge. People hated us. Of course. That's such a heavy city. Not just a hate, like a serious hate. Yeah. Right? And we're used to that. We're like, okay, we're going, ooh, she's a little runaway. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, kill your fucking they're, mom. Kill yeah, your they're mom. They're all like, black cow. Yeah, yeah. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> so I'm watching as we're playing and like from the balcony from all the way in the back seats this thing comes flying out right yeah and it's going going we're looking at it, and it goes bang and it hits our drummer tico right in the head it was world war one like binoc field binoculars <laughs> fucking hits him in the head whoa he's bleeding oh right we still finished it he had to get stitches oh shit so i that, can't believe you remember that oh, i remember i'm not gonna forget that one and then um the second night he wore a batter's helmet we wore a yankees batter's helmet <laughs> over his stitches in case more shit was coming at us. I can't believe I remembered seeing that. Did you guys play Sam Fran on the first record? Like yeah. uh, like a, a club or just uh, opening for someone? Because I used to book The Stone there in San Francisco, but I don't think you guys ever played that because you were like, seemed like you were big out of the gate, you know? Well, we open up for every, right out of the gate, we open up for everybody. And right. then like on days off, you would we headline? would play a club. Yeah. You know, just try to, do it on our own play more than 45 minutes you know it's 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 a great first record which is crazy you know like did you guys when you guys were recording that did you um just do it all in one night or was it left over from the demos i think the only thing we actually did was on that first record we had runaway first and that got us our deal right and then we went and basically wrote the rest of the record and went and did it and like in 10 days i think we were done when he calls you to join the band, he's he's like demoing, and then does he start to piece together the band? Yeah, so after, when when I left and I was going to school, he would just call me up to do to do demos, <clears throat> excuse me, to come into the studio, into the power station and work. And then we had different bands. It was, then it was a couple different bands. It was John Bon Jovi and the Wild One, so I was a Wild One. Yeah. And it was John Bon Jovi and the Lecher, so I was a Lecher. Oh my God, that's uh, a terrible. I have pins. Oh, it's terrible! I have pins from all that shit too. <laughs> yeah, really. It's great. Yeah, it's oh. great. I saved all that shit. Oh, I love that. And then it just became. Uh, and then that was kind of the older guys that are, are the guys that we were in our hometown. Yeah. And then once we got the record deal, then it was really just better players. I think really it was like we got Tico first. Right. Actually, we got Alec first, our bass player. Wow. And Alec played in a big cover band, huge cover band in New Jersey called Phantoms Opera. And then he knew Tico, so he got Tico, and then we got him, and then the last person, then they knew Richie, and then they got Richie, and then he came in, and we basically, from that point, I mean, literally in a month, we had the whole record done, and we were a band touring. It's weird, you know, you talk about the covers, because when you watch the Twisted Sister documentary, and I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it seemed to me like everyone on the East Coast only played covers. There was no original bands back then after that whole CBGB kind of uh, art rock yeah. movement and everything. You know, you got the Ramones later and stuff, but there was when I came to the East Coast, it was just covers only. So what made him want to do originals and, and think it was going to happen? Somebody in the biz told him, get out of this? I think you just, uh, yes, probably, and then also you look and say, I want to be the songs that cover bands are playing. Right. Because I th still think it happens that way. A cover band makes 300 bucks or 400 bucks, and then now you can go to weddings and make 10 grand or 12 yeah. grand. And then an original band, you're trying, you know, the, the club says, okay, no money. Yeah. Here's tickets. Sell them. You got to sell them. So, I mean, it's always harder to be an original band, but there's no future bigger than an original band. Absolutely. And you have to try it. And then if, you try to, I guess, a certain age, and if, you know, thank God for me, it worked out. And if it didn't work out, you know, you, you got to go back to, to a job. Yeah, yeah. Why did he, I, I always wondered this about Bon Jovi, but why did he want keyboards in the band? Because that was right, kind of an era where no one was using keyboards. It became kind of a two-guitar band, you know. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing was hot. And look what's hot back then. It's uh, Scorpions, ACDC. Twisted Sister, Motley Crue, all that stuff, and uh, none of them had keyboards. So what was the uh, thought on that? Was it Bon Jovi based, or I mean uh, Springsteen based? When we first started, it was piano. I played Springsteen and Juke stuff, so right. piano, Hammond organ. I had a CP80, a big, oh, really wow. cool cool uh, acoustic piano had to be tuned. Yeah. 
and that was heavy as hell, and I would always have to get three other people to help me hump my gear in. <laughs> oh, the, the worst. Van. Yeah. So freaking heavy. Hammond B3, Anna too. Leslie. Oh. And then I had a Krumar string machine, because I was hip. Whoa, what's that? It just made strings. It was like a cool string sound. Oh, really? So I could have like more than just an organ and a piano. Yeah, yeah. And then once we started the Bon Jovi world, we, I did everything anti-Springsteen. I was like, I don't want to play Hammond that way. I don't want to play piano that way. Yeah. I want to play synths. Right. You know, and I got a, a, a memory Moog. And I got, or actually, oh, my first one was a poly, a Korg Poly 6. I, still I remember had, that, yeah. And it had just these cool kind of sounds. I'm like, let me just try to do something different. You know, when it came to Runaway, where it was just, the chords were just, ooh, she's a little runaway. That was it. And I was like, what about, gun, 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 yeah. gun, 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 because of all the, influence i ever had listening to the cars i was just gonna stuff. say it's heavy cars here oh, she goes and yeah something that was driving and cool and make and the thing with keyboards i think john realizes that you got a couple of sounds for guitars but keyboards you have the whole scape yeah and especially when it came to like wanted dead or alive where it first starts out and you got wind like oh my god and, whoa. Yeah. did you come up with that like, oh yeah i was like what's the to me it looks like a cowboy spaghetti western yeah. and what happens and how how do you paint that and my classical background really gives me that the idea of like in every classical song you have all the emotion you know exactly what it feels like with no words absolutely so absolutely. my job to marry the emotion which is the words to what the soundscape is and that's what i brought to the table you guys put out a couple records you put out the first one, then you do the uh, 7800 Fahrenheit, which is hilarious to watch that video now. 24 hours, boys. <laughs> oh, it's so 80s. Oh, my God. It's the worst title. We, we were young, and yeah. we listened to the record company guy, a yeah. marketing guy. He's like, 7800 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the temperature that rock melts. Oh, my God. And we're like, cool, because <laughs> we were 23, and yeah. it's, it's actually the opposite of cool. Yeah. It's not cool at all. But at the time, at the time, it was at the cool. time, you know, when you look at the first couple records, you got Runaway, In and Out of Love, that kind of flavor. We get it; it's poppy uh, '80s rock. But then, when Slippery, when Wet comes, all of a sudden, it has this whole different depth. And uh, do you think that's because of like some of the outside writers, like Desmond Child, Holly Knight, uh, Deanne Warren, like when they come in? Is it like the record company are like, you need some big, big hits? Is there pressure? Why does this whole thing happen? So our first record went gold. Yep. Which we were pretty proud of. That's 500,000 records. Yeah, that's huge. Second record was almost platinum. We were 800,000, not a million. Wow. A million was platinum. Yeah. And the record company said, if you don't go platinum next time, we're dropping you. Isn't that crazy to think about? If yeah. you don't go platinum. You're and over. those first two records probably cost like, what, a hundred grand or nothing? Not, not, yeah, not, not a lot. So nothing. They were doing all right. Yeah. But it was that do or die. Yeah. So then, yeah, then Desmond Child came in as a writer. Who brought him in? I don't remember. Yeah. Record and company or somebody, I don't really remember. Are you on Mercury at the time or Vertigo? We started on Mercury Records and we're... we're all Mercury slash Polygram. Right. And we were all the way with them until they sold it to Universal. So we were, we've were we been on one record label forever. Wow. So they say you need some outside writers and you come in and you start working on it. And what was the first tune those guys got together? Was it Wanted Dead or Alive or Living on a Prayer? We were dem a whole bunch of songs. We demoed a whole bunch of songs in Jersey, in Sayreville. And we, we did it and it was... Uh, it was really funny. We had the pizza parlor jury. We would take it to this local pizza parlor, and yeah. we would we went into this one shitty little demo place. The guy had like a two tracks. So oh yeah, everything in two tracks. That's all you need. And he didn't. Uh, after I think the we did a couple days of it, and then we did overdubs. And into the overdubs, he found the counter. So like every time we try to sing the second chorus, he would rewind it to the beginning, and you'd wait to the chorus, and then he would rewind it, and then finally he found the counter. He's like, oh, oh there's a counter here. I'm like, oh my god. So we were. It was low tech. That's almost some ADAT shit. Remember that? Yes. We had to wait for him to sync up. Oh my god. Oh my terrible. god. You go here comes the overdub, and it would line up. And we play him for the pizza parlor jury, and these kids would like it. And John didn't even like living on a prayer. He left. Really? So we were recording, and he actually left, and me and Richie sang the whole thing, leads and and everything. Right. And he was like, okay, I think I like it. Wait a minute, so. Did he have anything to do with writing that? Yeah. But he didn't like it? Didn't like it. He's like, I don't like it. 
Wow. But we each, the thing about it is like whoever wrote it still came to the band and then you came up with your parts. Right. Everybody came up with their Did parts. Did you share publishing? No. No. <laughs> that's always a... Yeah, that's there's a, always the, uh, yeah. yes, the ills and the evils of the Whoa. music business. But it's all right. Yeah. It's all right. So then we went to Vancouver, which was brand new back then. Right. 1986. Bruce Fairbairn Ex- comes in. Yeah. Expo had just started we're way away from home yeah and we just went there and just dug in and we just made slippery and wet how and many we weeks were, uh really quick really quick i think we did basic tracks we got two songs a day so i think in five days we were done with the basics six days we had 12 wow. songs done with the basic tracks overdubbed it really like soup to nuts done really quick and then we went out and we were opening up for 38 special Whoa, weird, we were still, weird combo, yeah, yeah. Because we were still an opening act, and Slippery didn't come out yet. Right. So we're opening up, and they're paying us, you know, $5 a night. Yeah. And uh, we're thankful for that, because it's arenas. And they had, hold on, do slow. Oh, yeah. Don't oh, let them go. The, yeah. Number one song. Yeah. Huge, right? So Slippery comes out. We're now number one. We make the video, right? The video is funny as hell, because if you look at it, uh-huh. there's a good story, inside story of that video. So you give love a bad name. We film that with Wayne Isham. In L.A. at the Greek Theater, I think it was, or New York. I don't remember where it was. But there was like a hole in the ceiling. It was raining. Yeah. And we had like four fans or, you know, like 40 fans or, you know, not not a lot. So they kind of piled in towards the front. Yeah. And then when you look, go back and look at the long shots, those guys, uh, the, the video, video guy, Wayne Isham, was shooting Pink Floyd. Oh. So if you look, they would cut away to you know, like an arena. <laughs> so here's us, and they cut to an arena. If you look now, like 80% of the people have a Pink Floyd shirt on. Hilarious. So it's perception, not reality. Absolutely. So we created perception. Yeah. Through what well, we created, reality through perception. So we did it. It was so huge. We come out with the biggest freaking thing that there is. Yeah. And we're opening up for 38 Special. So we still have to open up for it. Our merchandising is like, 30 bucks ahead and there's is like a nickel Ooh. and they're like thanks we're making so much they bought us gifts they're like thank you thank you wow. and then the, you know we had to honor that for i think another month you had to stay on it we had to i mean we signed a you know you got to do we signed a contract yeah yeah do yeah i right think yeah and then we just went back a month later and toured the that was it the rocket ship took off and still going it took off like crazy around man. the planet. So the record company's going to drop us at a million. Yeah. So Slippery sold 15 million records inside of America and 15 million outside. Whoa. We sold 30 million records. Now you're out there. Who's opening for you when you're out there? Like were you bringing out some? Like you had Cinderella, I think, right? We found before that we had Rat first because we opened up for Rat the first tour. Yeah. And now we were because they had Round and Round, which is huge. Yeah. And then now it was their turn to open up for us. Wow. And it was cool, you know. Yeah, we were yeah. just we're cool about it. Yeah, yeah. And we just played. We played like eighty countries. Yeah. The planet. Yeah. People were coming out of a mud hut in Vietnam singing "You Give Love a Bet." Like everybody knew that song. To me, it was wanted, dead or alive. Like I, your band always had these insane ballads, insane. And I always said, in order to be the biggest band, you have to have the rockers for the dudes, you know. Yeah. And then you have to have the ballad that brings the women in, and then you've got a monster band. And that was the formula. You and know? we could play. <clears throat> and you and could everybody play. Everybody was a serious musician. Like Tico played on 60 jazz records. I mean, he was a serious studio cat here in New York. He played with Miles Davis. Wow. You know? I mean, he was a serious jazz guy. Serious, serious. That's incredible. And 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 Richie was just a, a, a monster, monster. You know, I mean, the guy could sing, play the hell out of the guitar. So the combo was really rad it was uh you know it was like something that a lot of bands didn't have where they had two guys that were really i mean john was a big star but sambora was right there man and when you see that wanted dead or alive video and the way it's shot it looks beautiful like film and everything it's It's just like oh and everybody's looking like because john's like they were all exhausted and it looks like it looks like we're you know exhausted actually I remember that was a really shitty get the monitor sucked so bad yeah. that we were all just pissed off. So it looked like we were just tired. We were just pissed off and the fucking monitor sucked. Yeah. It, and, it, they, and they captured that emotion. You look at it and you go, oh my God, look at those guys. They're so burnt. They've yeah. been on the road. We were just fucking- Metallica rips it later with Wherever I May Roam. The same yeah. kind of formula. The man, I'm burnt out here, city to city. You know what I mean? 
And it's, but you know, really, those days there was no internet. No, there was no. There was just the sh- social world. Yeah, no media. Yep. And you had to go door to door, and you, you know, you sold your wares everywhere, and you played and played, and then you went around the world. And we, we always say we play, uh, we played pay toilets around the earth and use our own change to start off, <laughs> and then just played the clubs and played the stuff and built it and built it and. And now we can go to anywhere. Like, we haven't been to Australia in a bunch of years, and we'll play 75,000 people. That's so wild, dude. It's crazy. You, there was a time when you look at John Bon Jovi, and, and if we're going to look at the, the, the whole 80s, as people call it, the hair metal thing, which I crack up on. But when you look at that whole thing, all the bands went away. And I don't know who was managing John at the time, but it looked like all of a sudden it was like, let's switch gears and only concentrate on Europe. And somehow that paid off because the always a song is huge in Europe and all over. And you guys just disappear from like, I don't know, 96 to 2000 and are concentrating in Europe and, and, and doing like Wembley Stadium and shit. And people are like, what? And then by the time you come back in 2000, you're doing stadiums again where you could have easily been doing theaters if you stayed out there, right? You know, it was the, the 80s were great, unbelievable. And then the 90s came in and then it was Nirvana, you know, Nirvana came in. Right. Alternative music. And it killed, because we're, they're alternative, we're popular. Yeah. So in Europe, it didn't work. The uh, the alternative people were like, I'm kind of not depressed and I kind of like life and I don't really want to kill myself and I kind of just want to party and have fun. Yeah. So that music and real that style never worked there. So when uh, we came out with Keep the Faith in '92, yeah, we went to stadiums the rest of the world and in America we didn't give up the fight. You know, I mean we kept playing arenas and we kept doing it, but it was you know we were swimming you know uphill it was uh uh, you know half filled rooms and stuff not half filled but there was empty seats you know and we weren't so happy about that but we kept pushing and pushing and pushing and that record goes double platinum we still did great yeah yeah i mean we we only did you know two or three million in america and 10 outside of america yeah it's like oh they're over you're like (laughs) nobody even sells two million records now no one so we basically so we went through the 90s we're huge in the rest of the world came to america still pushing hard and then at the end like alternative music was the, the fucked up part about that was their alternative we were popular now they're popular and we're alternative yeah so that's when Kurt Cobain is like I gotta kill myself he goes I just it doesn't make sense to me because here we are anti and now you're not anti you're it yeah and we're anti yeah and I think it just f- fucked with all of those that that genre so much yeah and then we came out with uh, it's my life in 2000 and bang we're a whole new we're still going on that i mean 18 years later right it's like the second chapter of it's just as big as slippery it was huge that's nuts around the world yeah i really think the new jersey record is is just a, a masterpiece for me you know because it was way more it had way more depth and nobody was really digging that deep um at that time i think it's 89 yeah. you know gnr has the incredible appetite explosion in 87 88 but this new jersey record definitely was way different than the first three records you know do you remember what was going through the band's mind all of a sudden you guys changed like you're getting older and maybe your taste is changing or, or you have more power what's going on there i think that was a combination like you, you wait your whole life to hopefully get a slippery and wet, and yeah. we got it. And and then you have like two months to write the next thing. Wow. And it was only that? Oh, it's like we, we toured, and we toured like maniacs. I think we did 300 shows a year or something more than that. It was like three on, one off, two on, one off, three on, one off for a year. And wow. I think we took a week and then did it again. It was just insane, the amount of touring. Wow. Really insane. And then wrote, wrote New Jersey, Went back and recorded that. We were back out on the road, I think, within a year. Yeah. Not even. Yeah. And it was all that experiences of what we really learned. Because the funny thing is, like, your perception doesn't change. Like, we just were doing what we were doing. All of a sudden, now the world goes, wow, that's great. We're like, we kind of were doing this all along. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. So you're just doing what you're doing, making music, trying to make the best it can. And New Jersey was, uh, was the extension of all that touring, of all that hard work and and plus a tight band i mean we played up to that but 
I think now we're over 3,000 shows, but I, then wow. it was like a lot of shows. So yeah. We're tight as a nun, you know what I mean? We're a serious striking unit. Yeah. Uh, I remember specifically Sam Kinison did the video. Yeah. And you guys handed out those Fisher Price cassette tape um, recorders, which are worth a fortune now on eBay. And there's actually film festivals done uh, with people that have shot films on those uh, mechanisms. If nobody knows what I'm talking about, I, I wanted one bad, never got one. And I ended up getting like a second wave. It's around here. But it was a... It was, Back then, the handheld. the handheld camera was popular for families to film their vacations and everything. And then Fisher Price made one for kids. And you could pop a cassette tape in there and film footage with this cassette tape. And man, those things are so fucking cool. And so you guys handed them out and let everybody, I think it was the LA uh, Forum, and let everyone film it, right? It was part of, it was uh, Wayne Isham, our director. Right. So he said, let's, uh, let's get people filming that yeah. for bad medicine on top of us. And then yeah. we had like real professionals and using Kinnison that. Kinnison was at the beginning of it, right? So I'm a comedy junkie yeah. of doom. You are. I'm a comedy junkie It's weird because your da daughter is in it now. Oh, yeah. Which she's thanks, doing it. Which it couldn't be better. Thanks for Gabby for hooking yes. this interview up. Gabby anyway. Bryan, go. Yeah. yeah. Um, growing up, I had more comedy records than music records. Yeah? Just an unbelievable comedy fan. So when I got to... Uh, Oh, yeah, uh, George Cohen, AM, oh. PM, Cheech and Chong. Oh, Cheech and Chong. I had every one of Richard Pryor's records. Oh, the best, right? I mean, he was the best. Cheech and Chong, too, man. Great. I always said that. You know, we, we're close in age. I'm 52, you're 56, born in February. I'm, I'm the third, you're the seventh. Nice, so, Aquarians. Aquarians, you know, but that era of comedy, man, and to really have that piece of vinyl and put it on, it really took you away. Life was so simple back then. You put it on, you're in the living room, and you'd be, you know, you hear like Cheech and Chong, like sneaking into the drive-in. First gear, ooh, second gear. Hey, be, keep it cool up there, man. <laughs> yeah, the Christmas song, uh, you know, all yeah. that. Just, yeah, they were great. But I didn't listen to the living room. I had to be in my room in headphones. Oh yeah, especially well, Richard Pryor. They, oh no, I would sneak. I had to sneak that record yeah. in. You know those. I can't even. It's racist to even say the titles. Oh yeah, you can't, you can't even, even say, say the, the titles. No, you can't even say the titles. It's hilarious though because you know my friend's stepdad had the record, so he'd be up at work and we just put them on and we'd be like, whoa, bicentennial N. Yeah, this yeah. N is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Then his third record was uh, he was tied to a, a telephone pole with the clan around. It was like, was it something I said? Yeah. The whole yeah. thing with Mudbone and all those. All those records I are insane. It. And then that live at the Long Beach Arena one, man, is incredible with the red suit. And he's oh, yeah. like, you know, that stuff. But so you were the one that got Kennison? So I was just such a comedy junkie. I, I, I was at the comedy store in L.A. Yeah. And I made friends with Sam. I'm like, actually, wait. I saw him at the Felt Forum. Oh, yeah, badass. Which was uh, uh, underneath the garden now. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, yeah. I think it's still called the Felt Forum. Yep. Or the Theater at Right, right. right. Felt Forum, it was New Year's Eve, and he was playing. And I didn't know him then. I was like, I need to see this guy. Because, yeah. you know, I, I saw his, uh, his stand-up, but from, from far away. So I was like, I need to see this live now. So we went. He was the sickest human I've ever seen, right? And then he starts talking about this necrophilia stuff, which is really sick. And then he stops there, and the whole place is, you know, completely just disgusted and cannot believe that this guy can go there. And he goes, he goes, you think that's low? I'm going lower. <laughs> and he went, he was such a sick fuck. It was so great. I'm like, I need to meet him. So I got backstage. I met him when we became friends. Yeah. And good friends. Yeah. And they were hanging out. I go out to LA and we'd be hammered. And he'd go, Come on, we're going to go do some, we'll go down to a comedy store. I go, Dude, I can't even talk. What do you, how do yeah. you even do that? Yeah, yeah. And he would go there and be the most intelligent. So when it came time for, for the videos, I was like to John, I go, Let's put him in bad medicine. I go, it's Sam Kennison. He'd be the greatest. Yeah. So Sam did it. And yeah. it's, it just was great. It was killer, man. It was killer. Because Sam was huge at the time. You guys were huge. He brought it? in Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. When I met Rodney the first time, I was like, oh my God, that's like an icon of doom. Uh, so Rodney comes down, he's smoking a joint. You know, yeah. he's like, he goes, hey, Sam's concerned right now. He's sleeping in the trailer. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess he is concerned. <laughs> he came with a tuxedo shirt and like Adidas yeah. short shorts. You know, yeah. I was like, I'm like, wow, it's, it's, it was so great. So, yeah, I'm a comedy junkie. Wow, man. He, do you have any great comedy store? Because that's my home club. That's where I, I started comedy uh, nine years ago next month. 
And uh, I remember hanging there in 88, 89. You know, back then, my buddy used to deal blow, and we'd hang out there and watch comedy. What, do you remember seeing other people there? And I saw lots. Yeah. But, but set, like, I would stay at Sam's house. Right. I'd stay when he had the Malika and his two girlfriend wives or whatever, the sisters. Yeah, or yeah. Kooky thing was. And we would sit there and, and watch, like, just watch TV. And yeah. he would mock out like everything on tv and it was the funniest thing i've ever seen oh man and he's a- like come on we're gonna go down there <laughs> we go down the hill because uh, yeah. he was above it yeah we go down the hill and he would just walk on and you saw I-, I just was in my glory yeah man wow such great comedians it's funny because your daughter's doing comedy now and uh, you got twins i do wow and that was like natural that shit is good yeah <laughs> six to the wall baby bang that was, yeah, that was natural, not in vitro. Because yeah. a lot of people twins now because in vitro and all that, you know. But that that just yeah. were you from pretty, these hair loins. Were you pretty su- surprised when that happened? I got a boy and a girl, which that, is a pretty good out of the first. That's cool. You got first it, batch. You're done, right? Bam. <laughs> What's your son do? He's uh, he's three minutes older, uh-huh. so he lets her know it. Yeah, uh, that's her older brother. I'm like, dude, it's three minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like she only kicked you out of the way, I think, to get out first. <laughs> uh, He's doing great. He lives in Hoboken, actually. Yeah. And he's working with Live Nation. You know, you married your high school sweetheart, so did Bon Jovi, right? And uh, kind of, I mean, you guys... Mine didn't been, work out so good right, as his. Yeah, yeah. He's still with her, right? Yeah. It's, it's wild. Uh, now, when you guys record New Jersey and you go out on tour, by the time that's done, you got to be pretty burnt. It's been a long run. It's like a long six years. and Long six years. What kind of stuff's going on in the band? Because I remember when Alec was uh, fired, there was always this uh, quote-unquote omorta, as John would like to say, of silence in your band. But was there a lot of tension and drugs going on back then? Because every band was full-blown and coke and everything. Were you guys deep in it? And what was going on? 84, from, I left my house in 84 and yeah. I came back in 90. I think I slept 15 minutes, wow. not in a row. Yeah. It was <laughs> too fucking great. It was too great. Yeah. Yeah, we worked our faces off. We were burned out. And it was, it was a break. Sl- we called it the break. It could have been a breakup. Uh, everybody just was so burned out. We just went home. Right. You know, and then and John did a solo record. Richie did a solo record and I worked on it. Um, Blaze of Glory. Uh, that. Yep, and then Richie did Stranger in This Town, yep. which I wrote with him. Yeah. And uh, and then that stuff kind of just flushed out a little bit, and we all got back together, and uh, we didn't really leave. You know, it wasn't a breakup. It truly was a break. And then we started back up and Keep the Faith. Everything was good. And, uh, yeah, it was tough. I mean, Tico went to rehab once, and he got it. Yeah. He came out, and he was great. Alec went to rehab a couple times. Not so good for him. Uh, so then he forced retirement, I guess you would say. Yeah. And then we got Huey then. And then Richie's last eight years of addiction, you know, he was in, in and out of rehab three times. Yep. And he decided not to do it anymore. So we're like, hey, it's a, it's a job, not a sentence. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it sucks because he's a brother, but he didn't want to do it. You think he'll ever be back? Strange thing about addiction is it doesn't cure itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's you know, it's that tough love thing, which is, like I said, I've been to rehab more times. Yeah. As a visitor. Yeah. Where I actually question, I'm like, am I fucked up? <laughs> like that. I was listening to the Bentmon uh, uh, podcast you did, and I'm listening. And I'm like, wow. I always knew I didn't want to get that fucked up. Yeah. My my career wasn't worth partying. I never walked on stage so fucked up I could never play. Right. Never. Other guys in the band were? Uh, at, at points, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love my jobs. I just love to play. And I'm, I'm playing classical since I'm seven. I'm like, yeah. but just get fucked up after. Yeah. You know, it, you can do it like everybody else. Yeah, yeah. When I walk on the stage, I, I take the, the stage. Perf- to me, uh, I honor the stage. To me, that's a professional thing. There's so many people that have done it. And I think you walk onto the stage with in the footsteps of everybody else who did it before you so don't be a dick bag and suck yeah you know i mean it's fun when i'm home and i'm playing like jamming with some bands and you're drinking of course and you're jamming on the organ and you know i love to play ham and i jam and and i it, it's pretty good and you listen back it's pretty good you know you always think you're better than you are oh totally and totally. then you listen back and you're oh yeah yeah <laughs> but uh i don't get that hammered yeah you know, in, in clubs but yeah. i would never professionally it wasn't worth it to me 
That was an era, man, where it was just the uh, enablers are around. And it's just, uh, you know, you're in these tour buses and they're like submarines and you have no idea of the real world out there. And it's just get on, play, and uh, go to the next city and just blurry shit, you know? We had a tour bus till 87. And so then here's jets? A, here's a great story about Whoa. that, right? Here's a great story. Yeah. So we're opening up for 38 Special. Yep. And now we're going to headline. And our manager at the time says to the promoter, goes, listen, you know they're coming back next month and they're going to headline. And you made a shitload of money on them. They got paid nothing. Why don't you get him a private plane to go to the next place? And he comes back and says, okay, we got a private plane. I'm like, I'm from Edison, New Jersey. I don't even know what a, a, plane, a private plane? I don't know what that is. I don't have, we don't have butlers. We don't have helicopters. We had nothing. Yeah. I, grew, I had the Menlo Park Mall. That's what I had. That was, our, that was the big thing. That was Mecca. Yeah. Not a private plane. So we get on this plane. And we're like, wow, this is fucking great. Because instead of a you know four or eight hour drive, you're there an hour and a half the most. Wow. Fly to the next place, go there and play there. And our manager did the same thing. He goes, you know, the last guy got a plane, so you should get those guys a plane. So He's we, getting planes out of the promoters. So we got free planes for a month. Whoa! Which is great. Then you get addicted. Well, then there's ne- you're never getting on a bus again. No, no. So then we, once it was our time to headline on a plane, and we've been on a plane since. Whoa! We said if we. If we're not big enough to be on a plane, we quit. Really? And even if we, we're like, we have to do one more show, whatever the tour is, add one more show, place for the plane. You know, pays for the plane. One show pays or for two, the plane. You know, whatever, two whatever sh- it takes. Yeah. So 30 shows, two pay for the entire travel. Just do it. And what kind of plane? G5 or an actual big plane with everybody? Oh, uh, well, band. 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 And we got a pretty, you know, big enough band and uh, uh the bra uh the alpha group not bravo bravo is uh, on but the rest of the world hired uh, guns are in the bus like no 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 they're, no they're on the plane oh really i just mean like crew yeah and, yeah, yeah of know, course all, uh, crew yeah and, they're on trucks and buses yeah they actually have a job and for us we're on the plane you ever had any weird shit happen in a private jet like whoa a couple times yeah we uh ran off the runway a couple years ago whoa. up in hamilton almost crashed so we got that one out of the way. Whoa. Like those guys. Remember the DJ and uh, the drummer from oh, yeah. uh, Blink-182, man? We were, we were coming into Hamilton on yeah. a big DC-9, this big fucking jet that we had. Yeah. And we're coming down, and we were hydroplaning, no warning or anything. And then we ran off the runway, but the front wheel sunk. Luckily, it wasn't frozen, because we would have went down the hill and exploded and be gone. Whoa. And the front wheel sunk in so everybody stopped short. Uh-huh. Cuz we did, it wasn't like warning, hold on, you know, everybody's right. just we're drinking and it's after the show. Yeah, yeah. So we go bang, everybody goes flying off our seats, flying into the you know, I fucked up my wrist a little bit. We Whoa. all kind of, you know, just bumps and bruises, not bad. You know, the plane sitting off the runway. If you google it, you could see it. Whoa. The plane is sitting off the runway. The engines are just like a foot off the ground. Wow. So, wow. And the plane is like teetering like this. And now they got the fire people come and everybody's coming. All these lights are on. Some guy comes up and we're, we immediately go to our stewards. I go, give me every, put all the booze you have in a cup. Whoa, that's crazy shit, dude. So like, we're drinking and drinking. I remember this fire guy comes past us and we're going, are we right? You know, are we all right? Uh-huh. He goes, no, you're good. Like, great. More drinks. So we're drinking, drinking. And then we're trying to figure out how to get us off the plane. Whoa. Because the stairs are yeah, kind yeah, of dangling. Yeah, yeah. And it's raining. So... I'm coming off the stairs and they're like, put down your drink. I'm like, fuck you. I have a heart attack over here. I'm like, with my drink on. You're not getting me. Wow, man. What was the other one? Uh, Skid Row was on. We played Alpine Valley in the 89. Yeah. Uh, And it was a serious windstorm that went through there. And we we played the show, got out of there, and we were flying. And we're probably like, 20,000 feet, and we dropped 10,000 feet. Oh, shit. Hit a wind shear, and was like, ah, and all the drinks were on the ceiling, everybody's screaming, and it goes, boom, and you look out the window, the wings go, wah. Whoa. But we didn't, and then they went through the wind shear. Whoa. So it's good if you're at 9,000 feet, and you lose 10,000 feet. Yeah, you're done. That's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. So we didn't let those those fuckers on the plane again. We're like, it's your fault. <laughs> you're not on our plane. <laughs> Snake Sobo, he played guitar on the first demos, right? Yeah, because yeah. he was. Snake lived uh, in the same neighborhood as John. Yeah, he was young, but we we didn't have anybody until we got Richie. So he was young, but he, you know, he took the. He was a placeholder. Oh, that's wild, if you will. I've known Snake since he's twelve. 
That's crazy. Because I started with John, I was I had my driver's permit. I was wow. like sixteen and a half. Look at those bands that John helped that sold millions to Skid Row and Cinderella, man. Alec I, found Cinderella. Oh, Alec did. He found them in Philly. They were playing in a club. He's like, guys, come on down and check these guys out. You mean you guys were on a night out and he went out? Yeah. Holy smokes. What a score. Yeah. God, great. that was a monster band, man. The first couple records. Yeah. That's another band that made like kind of an 80s rock record. And then the second one, Long Cold Winter, was just a masterpiece. Like, yeah, whoa. Blue, really bluesy. Yeah. Kiefer. Tom Kiefer was good. Oh, that guy's great, huh? When you were young, what what gets you into rock and roll? My, most people your age would be either Zeppelin or the Beatles, you know. Which one was it? Who was I, it? I, I started classical lessons when I was seven. Yep. My old man was a trumpet player. And he was a failed trumpet player because he was his parents grew up in Brooklyn, poor as hell, coming over from Poland. Wow. And he's like, you know, I'm gonna go uh, be a, a musician. They're like, No, you're not. You're <laughs> He was born in 1932, so, you know, 1950, he was 18. They're like, you're going to get a job. Yeah. You know, so I lived his dream. So he would always buy me everything, buy me the best everything. And there was a piano teacher, uh, classical, who retired. He led the NBC orchestra, orchestra on radio for 16 years. He retired to Perth Amway, New Jersey. So at, my father found out, which was the town where his uh, business was, and he took me up there to audition when I was seven. So I go up there, you're seven years old, you know, you're not exactly worldly. Yeah. And I walk in, this guy's playing this big brown grand piano, and he's playing Brahms and Bach and Schubert and Schumann. I'm like, whatever's coming out of that thing is the most beautiful thing. I need to do that. Yeah. And he taught me the C scale. He's like, sit down. He goes, here's the C scale. And you know, you do the finger with both hands. He's like, come back next week, you know, and know it or don't waste my time. Whoa. And I was like, I kind of just learned how to take a pee on my own without getting all over my leg. Yeah, seven. Yeah, I'm trying. I go, yeah. I'll try like a motherfucker, but that's <laughs> yeah. all I could do. Yeah. And I studied with him for 13 years. Wow. So when I started to listen to the Beatles and started to listen to the Stones, I would tell him that. And he didn't discourage. He's like, okay, let's see how that's composed. Let's see how that's written. Yeah. So we would take a Beatles song, I get the sheet music, and then he would show how it was, you know, how they composed it. Wow. So I was learning theory with that. So some of those early guys, like, um, you know, of course, Stones had tons of piano tons. all over it. And, uh, and Beatles, tons. Beatles, tons. Then I loved, uh, I loved Deep Purple, John Lord. Oh, yeah, just like Benmont. Made in Japan. Yeah, Benmont was way into oh, that. Oh, yeah. I had the same thing. I went, to, I went to the music store. I bought a big Marshall cabinet. I learned how to... The, some guy I knew learned how to juice it up so I could play through that. It was so fucking loud. With Hammond? Yeah, it was yeah. so fucking loud. It was great. Distorted and loud. And uh, and then I loved Yes. I loved Rick Wakeman. Oh, wow. And even like when I play now, uh -huh. I have keyboards on one side and the other side, and I play the split arm. So I'm playing piano with one hand and keyboards and then organ and Leslie with that foot. So they're going, and I sing. Yeah. And that was because I saw Rick Wakeman do Journey to the Center of the Earth yeah. at the Garden. And I saw him with these long flowing robes, which is the same kind of thing I have on the Slippery video. I was like, <laughs> I was like that dude, is, that's the man. That's killer. Love, yeah, Rick Wagon was great. There's definitely got to be some journey inspired in your guys' totally. band. I mean, you know, when you get into that. You that's know, high school year. Oh, God. Infinity is one of the greatest records ever made, I think. And, of course, Escape. You know, I, I'm definitely a Greg Raleigh guy. I don't, uh, I'm not a Jonathan Cain guy. Of course, that's their big era. But um, was Jonathan Cain a lot of influence on your playing? I like Raleigh. And then I love the babies. Oh, God, yeah. Right? So I, I love the babies. Remember Bad English? Yeah. Whew, man, I opened for them, but that was a great band. I auditioned for the uh, John Waite solo record, that first one. Oh, yeah? In 80... I'll Be Missing You? Yeah. And uh, Yes, the yeah. first, first I'll one. I'll Be Missing Sing You. Yeah. Since you been gone. Yeah. So I did... We were had Bon Jovi, and I was like, let me just audition for this. I got it from, from somewhere. Somebody said, okay, the record's out. And it was like the next day, so the management call. I called up. I was like, okay, I'll audition. And uh, they're like, uh, I, what song do you want me to learn? They're like, just learn the whole record. We don't know which one it's going to choose. I went, yeah. that's fucking 12 songs. Just pick, you know, give me three. Yeah. Oh, we can't. So I learned the whole record. I go there, and uh, Jonathan Wake walks in. He's all fucked up. He doesn't even sing. He just puts his head in my speaker as I'm playing. I went, hey, dude, I said, uh, I got the whole record last night. Yeah. Can you just sing? Yeah. So I know. I need to follow. Just I know where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> 
and and he was just too hammered. But uh, I was a, a huge Babies fan. So Jonathan Cain is, I mean, I, I know him, and he's great. Yeah, I loved him. He walked in with all those songs. I mean, he was the song guy. He walked yeah. in and was like, oh, uh, you guys want uh, Don't Stop Believing? You yeah. want, you know, all these great songs. It's pretty crazy, man, when you uh, really look at some of the songwriting. I mean, at the end of the day, to me, the only reason we're talking about Journey or Bon Jovi or a lot of these bands was the songwriting. And it still is. It still is. I, I don't care. You could have had all the flash pots and flying through the air and all that shit. But at the end of the day, if you didn't have the songs, you're not around now. And that's the bottom line. What's my but we were out to dinner last night with some friends and he's a, a party planner and and he's like, You gotta realize he goes, e every Friday and Saturday night, there's there has to be a, it would be amazing to count the number of every party's playing Living on a Prayer. Yeah. Everybody's playing It's My Life. Yep. Karaoke. Everybody. Everybody. Karaoke, cover bands, uh, malls, airplanes. It's the We're, power of, you need that hit song. Yeah, you need and, it. It's crazy, all the, I mean, Desmond Child, to me, is the a member of Bon Jovi. If you really look at it on paper, man, uh, yeah. these songs that were wrote, but John and Richie wrote some insane songs on their own. Definitely. Did they feel that they needed Desmond all the time, or they just brought it in to see what would come up? I think at the beginning, they did it, you know, for Slippery. Well, you got it, And then you saw there was less, yeah, and then there was less. And right. he didn't write It's My Life. Right. And some of those records, and now he hasn't written on the last bunch of records. But um, just at that time, he had whatever that combination was, was correct, and it's the heartbeat of... I think for us, we've always been, since we come from nowhere... I think it's all about the little guy making it. Yeah. And when we switched to positive, because even the, the the first record was was great, the second record was semi all right. Yeah. But then the third was really talking about, you know, living on a prayer, like we can make it. Tommy and Gene, you could be them. We are them. Yeah. We're from Edison and Woodbridge and Sayreville and South Amboy. Yeah. You know, we're from nowhere. And I think that, like, the little guy that can make it, that's that's always been it you know it's my life same thing yeah. i think the theme of this house is not for sale you know that whole our last record was, was great and that that's all about deep rooted and this is where we are and we're not selling out you know we are who we are yeah and we're the little guys that made it what was um what was the songwriting procedure was it pretty fast like would you, they just go into a room and start writing tunes or was it just like you were in the studio were you guys writing in the studio how was that going down Never write in the studio. Never write in the studio. Just went and demo. Every time you would just demo the stuff first and then go in. Kind of like batches. Like we would have like 10 songs. Yeah. Whatever. Whoever wrote the songs, 10 songs would come in and then the band would hash it out and then go in and demo it. And then go away, get another 10 songs, go in and hash it and demo it, go away. It usually took like 25, 30 songs to get 12. Wow. And are those songs ever going to come out? Like I think we've released it. Every all of them bit of everything on we, all the bone uh, like on the compilations and stuff yeah, yeah. i think it's, there may be a couple hanging around there but not too many was was always one of those songs or was that a new song that he just wrote for that compilation the crossroads one yeah that was a new one and then he came to me and i came up a lot da, 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 da. yeah all the piano parts and changes <laughs> you guys love modulations <laughs> I thought that the only thing I hated about I'll Be There For You was when it modulated. I was like, no! Yeah, we don't do that live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that's great. You don't? No. Oh, I love it, man. Actually, I forgot that we even did that. Oh, yeah. I we just had band practice uh, last, yesterday and, last, and the day before. Yeah. Two days ago, so we get to, we're gearing up towards playing the next leg. Yeah. So we did I'll Be There For You, and uh, I don't even remember the key change. Now I do. Wow, yeah, yeah. The hey John, if you're listening, don't do it. <laughs> John's never going to listen to this. <laughs> John's a pretty private dude, huh? Like, it's funny. He, uh, I saw him on 60 Minutes, I believe. He was, or one of the, maybe a good morning, a, uh, a morning show or something, when um, talking about his uh, restaurant where the homeless people work and stuff. But he's definitely uh, got a mystique. I think that he definitely tried to block out that 80s rocker thing, you know, and successfully did it. 
Yeah. Um, Remember and, when he cut his hair? Yeah. It was on like the tick CNN ticker. It was like, you know, the world could be at war. And John Bon Jovi cut his hair. You know, yeah. Like, wow. Yeah, yeah. He Did he ever, are you guys actually ever feel boxed in, you know? Um, I don't think you're really covered in that hair metal thing. But at the time, was there meetings like, hey, we've got to get away from this? I think, no, it wasn't meetings. I think it, was it just, just natural. Was, yeah, I think it was just natural. You yeah. know, he did it. He's always been, he always has that eye for the future. Really does. Yeah. You know, he always has that vision, vision and we'll fall him off the cliff. You know, it's like, okay. He cut his hair and we're like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and uh, I still won't cut my mind, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm keeping it. I'm keep, as long as it stays in my head, and that's. It's funny because you got curly hair, which was popular in the '80s, so you never had to get a perm. Everybody as, else was getting perms. As long as it stays in my head, I'm happy. <laughs> Isn't that funny to think about? I remember I got a perm. I was like, Sammy Hagar's the man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm Def like, Leppard. why would anybody perm their hair? I'm like, I was born with this shit. I would love to. Yeah, yeah, st straight hair. <laughs> That's okay. wild. Let's get a little bit into that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It goes like eight years you're not in, and uh, it's definitely was probably the people didn't think it was cool. You know, Bon Jovi's not cool or whatever. You know, whoever the people are that are doing this. But once you guys get in and you, you realize, okay, Richie's got to be there, of course, as I watched the footage, it looked like Richie and, and John were definitely not cool. <laughs> I mean, playing a little bit of uh, a little bit of act, but it felt like there was a, a line there in the sand. It was kooky, but uh, but John took the high road the whole time, and yeah. we did. We're like we had we had a couple rehearsals before in L.A. when we were out there just to make it easier for Richie. He said, oh, okay, wow. you live here, come in here, let's rehearse. So we were, you know. Put all the cards on the table. Said, "Let's just go and we're celebrating what we did." Right. You know, it's it's not now, it's it's then till now. Right. And, right. And Alec was part of that. Richie was part of that. Yeah. It was great to see Alec. I hadn't seen Alec, and my kids were born in '94. He's the last time we saw my kids, they were one. Wow. And the both and my kids were there, and he was like, looking, going, my my son is six two, and you know, Gabby's five. They're they're not babies. Yeah. They're not babies at all, so it was really neat to see him, and it was it was uh, it was kind of kooky, but it was good and weird. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because you look at at, at Richie, and it's just uh, it's his life. You know what I mean? Like I said, it's uh, three times to rehab, and I'm not going to sit here and do anything bad. You know, I'm just tough love. I'm yeah. always there for the guy, and I hope to hell he sees the light and you know straightens up. Is he still partying? Addicts don't get better on their own. Right. Wow. I don't really, we haven't really talked in years. Right, right, right. That's interesting, man, to think like, um, I always tripped out on like uh, older adults that party. You know what I mean? That's always a weird thing. Like I party like a madman in the 80s, but now yeah. I couldn't even imagine partying. Like I got, so, I, I love life and I got so much shit to do. Are you do. sober? Well, I'm not sober. At one point, I was like, I'm out. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just realized uh, it, it, you, you also get kind of bored with partying. And you get old. If that's, if that's your life. If it's your life, yeah. To me, I was always afraid of doing coke after a certain age because I thought my heart would explode, man. It's just like. It will. You know, <laughs> and, and a lot of dudes died around me. Uh, there was no joke. People were falling like flies in the 90s, you know? I realized I loved doing the art. Why was I getting high? The high was the audience. As cheesy as that sounds, I remember hearing guys say it that. That's not I, cheesy, does I, it? I would hear but guys it's the say, truth. Yeah, I'd hear guys say that, and I'd go, fuck you, man. You're just spewing out some sober stuff there. But, man, when I step on stage now doing comedy, it's a rush, man. You would never do it. I mean, I, I walk on stage with, with, with water. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all? Yeah, and I just love that feeling, you know, of like, oh my God, this is insane. It's great. Yeah. What, what, John's got to be a gazillionaire, huh? He's doing all right. I mean, a gazillionaire. He's doing 130 all right. million records sold in this day and age, man. That's, I mean, he probably could own New Jersey. Him and Bruce could probably buy the state. Exactly. <laughs> Did you, Howard Stern's induction speech was the best. Yeah. And they cut a lot. They cut it. He was really pissed off. And they cut a lot of it, but some of it was pretty funny. It's like 130 million records. He goes, that's more than the bubonic plague. 
Yeah. yeah. And he started putting it into reality. He goes, there's like a hundred... A uh, s- hundred sperm and a shot of semen. He goes, these guys beat semen. You know, it's like <laughs> a fucking funny guy. You now, I read you cut your fucking one of your fingers off, man. Yeah, in the in the nineties, I had a, a. I would always fuck myself up. But, yeah, but at least I fucked myself up when I came home. Oh man, so, yeah. yeah, I did so, a little thing, but it, it ended up healing, and I'm fine. Oh, thank God. And then you also, I read this about you, you got some weird African stomach thing and it like ate the lining out of your stomach? In South America, that was, uh, yeah. What was that? Parasites, that almost took me down. Whoa. And was it from food? No, because I was with Tico. We were on a golf course for some reason because he likes it and I don't really like it. He loves golf, right? He loves it. So I'm out there anyway just to get fresh air, I guess. And uh He's like, come on, we're gonna. There was a water fountain. We get drink from this because he's Cuban. Oh my! God. I guess he speaks the same language as the bacteria. Yeah. So they didn't attack him, but they got me. Whoa! Off a water fountain. Got all fucked up from. I got home. I was just sick as hell. Survived that. Wow. <laughs> but I always get sick when I get home. So I'm like, fuck! Now I got to go back to work. Yeah. The time I was off at home, I was just he didn't even fucked get a vacation. Up. No, I was fucked up. How many keyboards you got? You got a, a, a giant collection. I'm way into like those old tan Wurlitzers. Yeah, yeah. I, I love have, those. It's funny. I had all through the 80s and 90s with my keyboard tech that I had at the time, I bought as much shit as I could and then put it into this warehouse. Awesome. So I just bought it and bought it, but I filled up this gigantic to the fucking top of, of everything. Yeah. And then about... Six years ago, I was I, I rebuilt my house and I built a big studio. I was like, we're clearing that fucking thing out. Yeah. And I got all these keyboards out. I had a hundred keyboards. Whoa. I got Mellotrons and Clavinets, all that. Clavinets. I have a Baldwin harpsichord that the Beatles used on Strawberry Fields. Oh, sick. I have so much great shit. Whoa. And you still got it all. And and so I put it in my garage uh-huh. first and then Anything, and then I had my tech start to work on it, and anything I had to go away and get fixed, got fixed, and then it comes into the studio. Oh, that's sick. I have so, so you got like up. some Mellotrons with the tapes and everything? Yeah. Holy smokes. That stuff's worth a fortune now, too. Yeah. CS80s, you know, those, those Yamaha was the first one with this big ribbon thing, which is really cool. Yeah. I got those for like a grand, maybe. They're 23000 bucks. Whoa! Each. I'm getting those things fixed up. Oh, yeah, right? Just to have them. I mean, it's like a living studio. Wow. I had the same, that TX-18 was the big sound for living on a prayer. The yeah. Bah, it's like eight DX-7s in one rack. Whoa. Which is cool. That's so cool. Did you ever get into any clavinets, like, playing that, like, you know? I, I, bad medicine. Yeah, bad medicine. Oh, yeah, that's right. That is, yeah. It's a clav with a little piano with a little bit of some other kind of sounds and... Sprinkling fairy dust on that. What a record, man. What a record, dude. It's a good riff. And you know, wink, 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 oh, wink, I love wink, it. Wink, wink, wink. Yeah. What's the... Uh, is Let It Let it Rock on that one? Yeah. Oh, God, that's a great opener. You gotta Let It Rock. No, 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 no. The oh. organ solo at the beginning, yeah. that's, that's my ode to John Lord. Oh, yeah. And well, Wakeman. The backgrounds were always killer in your band, too. That's another key thing in your band. We could all sing. Crushing singing, dude. I backgrounds could sing. are, whoa, 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 gotta let it rock. Yeah, that shit is great. You me know? and Richie. Yeah. You and guys, Alec. Me, you, Richie, Alec, and then Huey sings. We, we all sing. You guys kill it, man. It's, uh, are you a car guy? What do you, what do you spend your money on? So you got a Rolex. You're a watch guy. Yeah. I'm a watch guy. I got my first, my first money I got. Yeah. I bought a Porsche 911 Turbo Carrera because I saw in Flash I saw that maniac. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that black Porsche. I'm like, first fucking money I get, I'm buying that. Oh, you still got it? Yeah. You do? Oh, yeah. Holy it's shit. 88, I walked into. That's I walked worth in, a fortune now. It is. I walked into the place. I had like a leather jacket on. Looking, yeah. You know, fucking scrungy at 26. Yeah. And uh, it was forty grand, I think, at the time, which was you know a lot. Oh yeah, in, in today's dollars. So I go to the guy. I go, listen, I want to buy that Porsche. He's like, yeah, okay, kid. Whoa! And I was like, oh, you're a dick bag. I'm gonna go to the next salesman. I go, you see that guy over there? He just lost a sale. I go, I want that right now. Yeah. So I bought it, and I got. I just. Uh, it, it has thirty thousand miles on it. Whoa! That's it, huh? That's great. I just take it out. It's it's such a just a, a machine. Oh, you know, you them. take it out, drive it a million fucking miles an hour, yeah. and put it back in the garage. Exactly. My I gotta drive a, that thing. My buddy's a cop from, you gotta come and drive it. Yeah. My buddy's, uh, at the time, he's still my 
uh, one of my good friends in seventh grade, Sal the Cop. Yeah, Sal so, the Cop. So Sal had all of his uniform on. I just got the Porsche. I'm like, dude, get in it. Uh-huh. I go, we're going. Yeah. He goes, don't fucking kill me in my uniform. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I went on the parkway. Uh-huh. First gear, it's only four speed. Yeah. First gear was a speed limit. I go, speed limit. Second gear, double speed limit. Uh, third, I got it. The speedometer goes up to 170. Yeah. I was past it. I was doing about 185 miles an hour. Whoa. It wasn't even redlined yet. Yeah. And, and then I slowed up, and that was about, I did it once. That was it. Fuck. But I would drive it. I'll drive now 140, no problem. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem, 140. Talking on the phone at 140. Yeah. Like That's amazing. Manageable. You still got it. I love you for that, dude. And then you got a 911. Did you get a, any other cars, or was that, was you, you weren't stupid with money? No. No. Not you. Yeah. <laughs> We have a higher authority. Yeah, yeah. Banking is our middle name. Yeah. Now, how was that working? Were you just getting um, money from sales? Since you didn't have the publishing, your sales but and record touring? sales, huh? And t-shirts? Were you cut in on that? Bottom line, everything. Oh, wow. Oh, that's fucking great. So you made some good money. Yeah, we're knock on, knock on what I made dough. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, thank God. I love you, dude. And your watch guy, are you a watch guy or do you just have one? So this one, got oh, I a, got a bunch of them. You got a GMT there with rubies and stuff. And white gold. White gold. This is a special one. Uh-huh. I was in London, and I saw this watch. And I always wanted just the regular stainless one. Right, right. And I saw him's I was like, what's all that stuff? The Pepsi. Yeah, the, and this has you know rubies and sapphires, and it doesn't look all blinged out, but it's cool. Yeah. And it was right before the Tonys, for, uh, and I was up for it for Memphis, my yeah. musical. I want to get into that after we, we will. talk. Yeah. So I look, and I went... I'm going to buy that for winning the Tonys. Yeah. And it was before the Tonys, so I'm like, I better not jinx myself, right? Oh, fuck. So I like bought it, and I went, I got back, and I won. I was like, okay, I got to engrave. I got to get engraved. To me, from me, love me. Wow. I love it. How long you had it? 2009. 2009. Now, how do, you, how do you get into Broadway? It's funny because you're like, uh, you're such a keyboard player, you know, like keyboards, Broadway, you know, like that's all... All in line, it seems, you know? If you have that kind of training. Yeah. How did you get into it? I, so at, in 1990, when we had the break, yeah. I tried to do a solo record. Now I'm, I'm like third guy in Totem Pole. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, there's John, there's Richie, and aren't you the drummer? You know, oh, they, the, the worst, fuck right? I am, right? It's great, though, sometimes, right? It's, Walking at through the airports. end of the day, yeah. I get to fly under the radar. <laughs> I, I hated it back then yeah. more, and now I'm like, I'm actually all right with it. It bothered you? It always does. It hit, you know, you're like, you know, I'm not the fucking drummer and you yeah. should know my name. And, and, you know, you got that little bit of, you know, you're pissed off. Yeah, yeah. You're there since day one. Yeah. I'm you like, contribute, you sing, you're a yeah. huge part of the sound. And then there you are backstage. They're like, can you step out? We're going to get a picture of uh, Richie and John yeah. here. And, and like, then your time for record deal, like, uh, and I wrote great songs. Like, no, I, it just didn't work out. So I put out my, it, it just didn't work. Right. So I'm looking and going, okay, what can I do? What can I do? And then I got a, I wrote uh, uh, in these arms. Oh yeah. On, oh yeah. On keep the faith. Yep. So I wrote, co-wrote that with John and Richie, and then I got a publishing deal from that. So I got a deal, and I went to the publisher. I said, "Listen, I, I, I'm not doing a banking deal. I want to learn the craft. Put me with all your songwriters." So I wrote with all their songwriters. Got ten really great songs. I got one cover. Curtis Steiger's uh, called This Time. Yeah. Clive Davis called me up and said it was the best song he heard all year. Whoa. I was like, wow, that's great. It was. It went top forty, so I, I got the thirty eight, I think, or thirty five. That's sick. It was great, and then that was it. And then my publisher was like, you know, okay, well, I want you to write another song. I went, I'm not going to write anymore. You can sell one. Yeah. There's ten great ones. When you sell one, I'll replace it. Otherwise, it seems like there's no, you know, there's no ends to the means here. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, right. All of a sudden, you got like thirty songs that are just sitting there. And it's for a lot what? of work. Yeah, and for what? So I'm yeah. like, I'm not doing that. And he looked at me, he goes, What about musicals? I went, What are they? And he said, I can get you 18 songs covered eight times a week. I went, I'm interested. Wow. And it was John Tita. And I thanked him on the Tonys because that was the only reason why I, I could get that many songs covered in a week. I wow. couldn't get that many songs covered in my lifetime. Wow. So, so you just sprinkled them into musicals? Well, I just, so the first one I did was for the Sweet Valley High. It was 1998. And it was Sweet Valley High, which is a girl's book. Sold like 450 million copies. Wow. If you sold a 40, 450 million toothpicks, you'd be happy. Yeah. And uh, it's like, okay. So it was up at Good Speed, which is Connecticut. 
and it was this uh, this woman, Francine Pascal, wrote it. So I wrote all the songs and the lyrics. So I did it, went up there to good speed. I think when we opened, I pushed a whole row of walkers over. No oh, shit. And I look in the room, and there's all like 70, 80-year-old people. I went, I'm dead. Oh. I'm dead. And then we played it, and I was dead. People are like, why is it so loud? And why do you keep repeating that part? I'm like, it's the chorus. <laughs> and, and all that noise is in the way of the words. I go, it's not noise, it's music. Oh, my so God. It was too early for rock. Yep. In 98, just was. And then in 2001, I got a script from an agent, and it was Memphis. And some, it was written out. It was like 110 pages. Some of the lyrics were there. And I read through it, and it was, I heard every song in my head. Because it was, it was, it's about the birth of blues. It's a birth of rock. I mean, the birth of the DJ, the birth of civil rights. But it was really about these songs. And I went, that was my first band. It's a 10-piece horn section. I, yeah. go, I know. This is like, hold on, I'm coming, knock on wood, in the midnight hour. Like those great songs. Yeah. And, and I, so I called up Joe DiPietro, my collaborator. And I call him up. I said, I said, listen, I hear every one of these songs. He's like, do you hear anything else? I go, there's other noises in my head, but we'll get to that later. And that was at noon on whatever day it was in 2001. And he goes, okay, well, just pick a song. I said, well, you know, I'm also a, a lyricist. He goes, yeah, do what you want and then send it to me. So bang, I picked this one song called Music of My Soul. And he had words written. And then he went, you know, it broke down all my senses, yet made me feel so whole. I love it till the day I die, the music of my soul. And then bang, and went on and went, I love it till the die, the music of my soul. The music of my soul. I said, in rock, we repeat shit because maybe we're not that smart and uh, as a joke, but you know, it, it really drives home what the title right. is. And it's a hook. So I immediately went into my fucking studio, got the drum, drum machine, played the piano, wrote those parts, put the organ on, put strings on it, put horns on it, sang it, sang all the backgrounds, burned it to a CD because there wasn't the internet really good then of course got i knew the fedex was 6 30 yeah at my fedex place in colts i got it there i was there at 6 15 oh and handed it to him he had it in the on his doorstep that next morning called me up he went you're in and that arrangement is the way it is today wow and i just heard everyone that's and I, crazy i walked into the room and it's like do you know what you're doing i'm like yes i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> never grew up on musicals yeah I saw Fiddler on the Roof, because like I said, as a Jew, that's your bar yeah. mitzvah, rite of passage. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw Phantom of the Opera, you know? <laughs> one. <laughs> one. One. And you're like, oh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's different. Were you kind of inspired by like that movie, The Commitments, and that kind of thing? Where you that's get, right. yeah. But this was really just, the cool part was, so I could write a song from a, from a white DJ, then I could write a song of a black girl and her struggles, and then her mother's white, and then a congregation, and then an old guy, a young person, all these, all these different characters. And I think that songwriting experience I had at Warner Chapel really helped because we wrote, like, hey, let's write a song for Tina Turner today. Yeah. You know, or whether it gets to her or not, let's just think in our head we're going to do that. 100%. So that really taught me for anybody. And then you walk in, and we, had, we put it up, and then it came time when, when we were orchestrating. I didn't even know what the word orchestrations were. Right. And I'm like, well, I wrote the drum part, the bass part, guitar parts, all the keyboard parts, the organ part. And then with my orchestrating collaborator, I, uh, we went over horn parts because I, I, I kind of directed him what I like. But he's like, I go, what if it does this? He's like, you know, a trombone doesn't do that. I'm like, oh, okay. You're smarter <laughs> yeah. than me in that yeah, way. Yeah. So he wrote everything down. And, uh, and Daryl, and he, um, I said, leading up to the Tonys, I was like, we were out, and I went, what's, what's orchestrating? Because it seems like there's a category for this. And they're like, well, that's, uh, it's like, uh, con not arranging, but telling what everybody to play. And I went, every instrument to play. I went, I kind of told everybody what to play. Yeah. So I called up Daryl, and I went, hey, Daryl, I go, I'm not, you know, the money is, we're done with the money deal. I said, but I think I should get credit as a co-orchestrator. And he's like, Daryl Waters. And he's like, you definitely, you did that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like two weeks later, I won a Tony for it. Whoa. I won a Tony for composing, uh, for, for music and lyrics. I won a Tony for orchestrating. We won a Tony for producing it. Wow. So in one night, I won more than anybody in the history of rock. Is that, that's crazy. Crazy. And, and how many Grammys uh, Bon Jovi got? So here's the greatest thing about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh-huh. We 
were never the critics darling as of you course. said before never yeah. and that is the critics darling home you know we were never on rolling stone nobody you know we just weren't in that world everybody yeah. was like you know despite the 130 million records they suck you know yeah. and despite the fact that they play great and everything they suck yeah so we would always get those kind of reviews yeah, some Van Halen shit. Yeah, just we just we're talented as hell and sold out everywhere and the biggest thing in the world, but they suck. Yeah. So um these guys won't be around past yeah, a year. Exactly. This so, hair metal shit. <laughs> so when I wrote all these songs and then the night of the Tonys, it was so great because I won all these and everybody's like, Who the fuck is it? who's he? Yeah. And I was like, How y'all doing? <laughs> Welcome, motherfuckers. Yeah. And it just was it was really, really unbelievably great. So do you have Grammys? So the Grammy, so yeah. we have one Grammy. We one? Were, we were never, well, I think we were nominated maybe for one. Uh huh. Never through Slippery, never through anything. We won for a country collaboration oh. for Who Says You Can't Go Home. Oh my God. One Grammy, we only won. That is absurd, man. But we won the People's Choice, right. MTV Award. Anytime it was the people, yeah. we won everything. Sweep. Yeah, we swept everything. But, you know, the critics are like, you know, they suck. <laughs> and now we're finally in, so they're like, we'll see, uh, we'll see. Does, I always feel when I do hear a John uh, interview that he does have his chip on his shoulder from that. Instead of just letting it go, he's definitely like, oh, no, hey. We're from Jersey. We're like, fuck you. If you were in a room, we'd fucking kick your ass. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I know. And then now it's like, okay, you're in. So now it's, and even the reviews from the record, and now they're, they're different. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we're like now. Oh, you're in the machine we're, now. We're in the club. After 30-something years. Yeah, we're in the club. God, that's crazy. Like, oh, thank you. Now, you guys getting ready to go on tour. You're going to Japan. Yep, Japan and Australia. Wow, that's going to be incredible, right? Stadiums. We do, uh, they have these indoor baseball stadiums in yep. Japan. Yep. They're like 65,000. Yeah, I've been there. Tokyo Dome. Yep. Yeah. Tokyo get, Dome, Osaka Dome. Yeah, those are great. I, was, I used to work with the Stones, and man, those things are insanely huge, it's man. Great. Yeah. And then we go down to Australia and we do like like giant stadium size stuff. 72,000, 75,000. You guys did giant stadium, right? A shitload of times. Yeah. <laughs> 10, 12, 15 times maybe. God. Now, when you guys rehearse, how do you pick the set list? Do you guys, uh, you got to just do the goddamn hits, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, uh, I'm of the ilk of you never want, I hate the bands that don't play the songs that you want. Yeah. I just hate that. It's yeah. like, you know, and you and if you're bored of it, then don't tour. Yeah. Just my own personal opinion, but I got do whatever you. the fuck you want. Yeah. But I mean, for us, there's never going to be a night without the big hits. Of course. And then we change it up. I think we, we know like 70 songs. Yeah. I saw you guys one time. It was in, um, God, this is a great story. I was... Uh, fuck, I don't remember. Somewhere in America now. It's, it's dry, I'm drawing a blank where... But you guys played a corporate for t uh, Toyota, and there was a dude that um, it was ZZ Top and you guys. Just some uh, each band got like a million dollars. I heard, you know, and it was just a party for to Toyota execs. Yeah. And I was in town with the Stones on a night off. My buddy called me. He goes, "Hey, get down here." It was the most crazy thing I've ever seen. There was like a couple hundred people in this kind yeah. of hotel ballroom. ZZ Top played, and then you guys played. And I was like, what the fuck? It was rad. I was in the front just taking pictures two feet away. You guys do a lot of corporates? Those are, hey, listen, there's a, for those shows that I play, that I made $7, yeah. I'm making up for it. Oh. <laughs> I'm still angry. Still angry. <laughs> I love you, dude. Awesome. <laughs> pisses me off, that seven bucks. But, that, yeah, but those corporates, man, I remember being at it. It was great. You guys just, you guys kicked us. It wasn't like, yeah, we're at a corporate. It was like killer. Was we like, had a great, one of the greatest one of the corporates was, uh, we did this one for some investment place. It was close to my apartment. I have an apartment here in New York, and I actually could walk to it. You got an apartment here? Yeah, Upper West Side. You're a badass. I made it to Broadway a bunch of years ago. <laughs> yeah. When did you buy that? Years ago? Like low money? Back 2004. Oh, yeah. Oh, still 14 years ago. Pretty yeah, yeah. cheap still, yeah. Still all right. And, uh, and we actually, my road manager's like, do you want a car? I'm like, no, I think I could just walk there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just, I walked there. It was the first gig I ever walked to. I was like, I actually walked. And when I was done, I walked out of there. That's so dope. So we go out 
and it was for this investment company. So we're we're going, the lights are off, and bang, the lights open up. We go, you know, shut the on, you're too many, you can love a bad name. Bang, bum, 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 bum. and we look, the front row is like 80 year old people. Oh shit. These guys are sleeping. Uh, the sleeping. Guy's like, sleeping. Grandpa's sleeping. <laughs> and the old lady's got her fingers in her ears, right? Like this. <laughs> That's how we come out. Uh, the whole front row is sleeping. The guys are sleeping, and the women have their, uh, everybody has gray hair, and they got their, their fingers poked in their ears, yeah. right? So John goes, shh, shh, stop, stop, stop. He goes, we don't want to wake anybody up. He's like, here's some, he goes, anybody have any uh, earplugs? So we got the earplugs for the old ladies, Yeah, and they all put them in, and then we started up again. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then just counted the songs back. We're like, all right, nine more, eight But the more. rest of the place was loving it because they were the younger investors, oh, wow. you know, not yeah. the, the old stodgy investing group you ever play like a, a super rich guy hired you guys like hey come play my daughter's uh bar, mit bar mitzvah or what, anything we've done a lot of strange things yes yeah. we did a, a a toga party in a backyard for this billionaire in aruba whoa for like 100 people and they're all in togas how long ago was this in the 2000s that's killer a toga party <laughs> it's like in Aruba. In Aruba. Private flew us, jet. Flew us down. Yeah. Play for an hour. He's like, thank you. I'm like, no, thank you. Yeah. I'm not putting on the toga, but thank you. And then we flew, didn't even stay and flew out. When we were wow. Down. Any other crazy ones like that? No, that's about the craziest. No, a toga party. I love like a that. Toga for 100 people. Have you guys played the Super Bowl? I can't remember. Nope. No. We, we played the half. We didn't play. The, we want to play the half times, but we never have. But we played... Uh, after 9 11, when yeah. the NFL started up again, we played in Times Square. We kicked off the NFL again. We were played right where they dropped the ball. Oh, yeah. So they built up this gigantic. I was 60 feet up. I could see Central Park from Times Square. Whoa, that high? It was unbelievable. And you, and every couple of streets, they had, uh, they had delay speakers and delay video. Oh, I think we had 500,000 people all the way up. Oh my God. To the park. And then we played a couple songs and then we helicoptered the giant stadium and went in there and played before the show. That's incredible. It was great. Dooley's in one day. And I ended up where the stage was. It was funny as hell because I have season tickets there. Yeah. So we go to where the stage is and my my you could use your season season tickets my buddies were in the seats and the stage was right next to my seats that's insane and i'm like turn around my buddy's like hey, <laughs> hey how you doing you're welcome for the seats <laughs> oh man oh thank i can't thank you enough for doing the show dude. Well, no i got some good news though. oh yeah what so so the next world of my broadway stuff we just announced yeah so we did joe dph and i did memphis and then we did uh the next one was toxic avenger so oh, we won right. the best off broadway and then we started another project uh, called Chasing the Song, all about the first woman song publisher in the 60s. We were working on that for a while and got that going. And then we just started about two years ago. Uh, Joe, Joe said to me, he goes, what about uh, something on, we're figuring out what's the next. And he goes, what about something on Princess Diana? I went, oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. So we've been working on it, and uh, we're going to La Jolla Playhouse. in, in uh, We opened there in March, yeah. Oh, wow. That's in funny. March. And uh, we just released it, I think, three weeks ago, and VanityFair.com released it. So we got a big one on the hook. It's really, 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 wow. really great subject and great. And I wrote 30 songs for it. Holy smokes. So it's, uh, and it's pretty neat. It's honoring, it's, it's honoring Diana, and it's, and it's not, it's kind of like a, a Greek tragedy because everybody kind of was, oh, like, everybody. you know, it was a marriage that was very kooky. Yeah. And if you take away, if you take away the royalty, it's a very human story. You know, you had a, a girl who, as a, as a little girl, always wanted to marry a prince. She does. The prince doesn't love her. He loves the other lady. And yeah. he couldn't leave, you know, the, the kingdom. So he couldn't be with her. And then he has a mother and, who's the queen. So it's a very human story. It's, and it's a like crazy everybody's story. kind of trapped. And, but it's celeb at, the, at the end of the day, it celebrates the life of what Diana did for charity. She's one of the first ones that started charity. Oh, the landmines stuff. The landmines yeah. and AIDS. Oh, and, yeah. You know, everything, you know, she was a really a, a huge force and, and definitely the reason why her sons are the way they are. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, I'm excited on that one. It's, That's it's, awesome, man. What's it called? Diana. Oh, Diana. And I did a thing where I, I wanted to make each character have a musical voice. So Diana is like pop rock of the 80s. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Charles and... And the queen are classical. Yeah. 
you know, all string Absolutely. quartet, but in a contemporary song, just with strings. And then same with the Queen. And then the uh, the paparazzi's punk, punk guitars like the Clash. Oh yeah, yeah, sick. ugly. Yeah. And then uh, Camilla's like you know light FM. Light you know FM. I mean? <laughs> yeah, and, and then, adult rock. <laughs> yeah. And then at one point, I have them all playing at the same time. So you're hearing classical and punk comes in and rock comes in and light FM comes in and they're all at the same time. Wow. Which is not, it's easier on paper than in reality. That's pretty badass, man. That you you also have something to do outside of Bon Jovi, you know what I mean? Which Big is time. great, yeah. I mean, I've written. And you got your Tony, a Tony award winner, like multi. It's killer. And I mean, in my four shows already, I'm, I'm over a hundred songs. So yeah. I'm not frustrated as a songwriter. No. Not at all. And you making some paper from that? It's you can make a couple. Sh you can make a beautiful dollar in this business. No joke. That's like real money, right? It's, it's like it's not. You know like what? That. You if you get a good one, yeah. you get a big one. Wow, that's wild, man. Well, looking back now, um, what do you think your all-time favorite Bon Jovi record is? I never asked that question, but I, I, I felt like I needed to ask it because there's so many records and it, it, in the career of, that you played on there. Which one do you think it is? So hard. Yeah. I mean, the, the, going backwards, I was, uh, This House Is Not For Sale was really a monumental thing for us because it was the first one without Richie. Yeah. You know, and it was without Richie. So we went into the studio and uh, John really relied heavily on me. Mm -hmm. you know and I, I looked at what the songs were and i got them all charted them all out wrote them all I'm like hey why don't we do this and what if we change that and what if we do this and he was really receptive to that and then it came time to do all the backgrounds singing on it. i sang all the backgrounds wow so i was a huge part of the, the making of that record so i was really proud of that and i guess there's no real you know i mean slipper and wet was yeah i mean that's the, the it's, and it's my life it's those moments you know I mean that record still. I still cannot believe how big "Slippery When Wet" actually you know, was. And it's such a kooky thing. Like I know when I when I leave and I get in my car, I'll turn on the radio. It'll be it'll be a Bon Jovi song. Yeah, it's so wild. Like it's sometimes in my life, you know, I'll just turn on that car and listen to the radio, and it's crazy how big that is. And I'm so ha I still feel like a kid listening to my song on the radio. I remember one time being pretty fucked up, up on a couple night bender, me and my buddy, this guy, Steve McDonald, and we had the vinyl, and I must have played Wanted Dead or Alive like a hundred times over and over, just loaded, sitting there listening to it and like analyzing it and going like, you know, because I'm playing music at that time, and I'm like, how do you write a song this good? It was such a saga, that song, you know? Yeah. It, it was all that touring. And, and, the, and the way those vocals, you know, wanted, wanted, the answer and call, you know, and, and also same with I'll Be There For You. I just love that, you know, that, ooh, baby, my no, my yeah. hand on top, you know, then coming in, I know you yeah. have to do that. <laughs> I'd be soul. like, fuck yeah. It's soul because we all, you know, we always love soul. It's so great. Soul music. It's, and making that. Uh, I, I remember doing the basic tracks of that song because we were in the studio in Vancouver. We tried it a couple times. It was all right. We went out to the, this Mexican place we'd always go and had like a, a shitload of margaritas and, and came back to the studio and went, okay, let's try it once. That was it. Wow. That was the really? magic. That was the, the magic. The margarita tanker one comes yep. on. Just everybody was loose. We did it enough. We know everything. It's like, just forget about it and just play. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the hardest part about being in the studio. Not, re you know, having that red light fever and that, you know, stiffness of it's the studio. It's a skill set. It really is. You got to get lost in it. Yeah. And you just have to make believe you're in front of all those people. Wow. Man. And the energy and put that yeah. much into a room when nobody's in it. What a great band, man. What a great band. I'm still hoping for Richie one day. You know what I mean? I, hey, listen, I, <coughs> I, I wish the guy the best, and I hope he uh, yeah. finds the light. Yeah, I do too, man. And uh, I'm glad you guys are all still here and making music. I, I just love people that uh, have had a massive career through all the uh, trends and are still there and, uh, and making records. Not just going out and playing the 10 from 86, 7, and 8, you know, exactly. out, you know, making records 
and and doing it you know what i mean and having fun playing yeah having i mean fun. like i said we were in the studio yesterday just you know in a rehearsal place at, yeah. at john's in jersey actually and we're all in a room and we're just looking at each other and go you guys yeah. rehearse at his house yeah wow where, where does he live He's he's in the city, but he has a place in Jersey, and that's where he has a studio, like a separate, like a big carriage house. Man, so I it's saw a big ass room. I saw some fucking crazy Patty bought here, and it was in the New York Times. Yeah, he's done all right. That fucking thing made my head spin. That pad, dude. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, that's some Bon Jovi money right there. It's all good. So he lives in the city. He's been, yeah. Ah, that's cool, man. Yeah, uh, have you seen the Bruce Broadway play? I have not. Oh. Dude, it is. You gotta see that. It's like you know what? It's it's Bruce. It's storytellers. Yeah, but it's it's mind boggling to see it. Oh, I, listen! I have a cassette tape when he jammed with us in like 1979. Really? He came because we were playing the fast lane. He played the pony. Uh huh. And uh, and if you haven't been to Asbury, you need to go there. Oh, I love it. It's unbelievable what oh, they did. Oh, 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 they've redone it. I mean, since I don't know when you've oh, been there. Oh, last. I haven't been there since '06. Oh, when you go there, it's. It's 100%. It made it. Really? Because I was there. And made it. I was at Stone Pony. And it's I was still just a ghost kind of town shit. there. Yeah. Now there's that, that, that burnt out building thing that oh, they never oh, built. Oh, yeah. That's now right. completely built. Really? All the clubs are built. Like these two big groups came in and bought everything and Whoa. made everything great. I got to get out there. Because when I was great. there, it was that deserted Pee Wee Golf. No longer. Around the corner was some weird triple X theater. Yeah. What the fuck was that thing, dude? That knocked that down. That was so weird. And then you had the place where Bruce always rehearsed on the left there. Yeah. And I was with the Wallflowers, and they told me all the great Bruce stories because Bruce come down and play with them at the um, at Stone Pony, you know. But all that man, when you're there, it's, it just feels like Bruce Land. Wait till you see it now. Really, it's I gotta get over so there. So unbelievably built up. Did you? Guys- I never thought in my life. I mean, I go there a lot because I'm, I'm I only live. 15 minutes from there right and we drive down all the time and there's just great restaurants and great bands and they they just built up uh, asbury lanes which was next to the fast lane wow and uh but we used to play there so bruce played with you guys so bruce would always play on sunday nights he'd always sit in with whatever band was there uh-huh. and we're playing the fast lane and there's nobody there because everybody's there to see fucking Bruce, right? Yeah. So one of the Sundays, he finally came over, uh-huh. and uh, we he sang the second verse of Promised Land. Wow. All the dogs on Main Street, how? Because they understand. Yeah, I love you know, it. It's like, oh my God, Bruce is... Oh, it was oh. such a great thing as a seven... I was 17 years old. Especially 79, Bruce. Oh, He's God. so rad then, you great. know? It He's was... unbelievable around that era, you it was know? Great. 75 to 79, it's like, what the fuck? And then he gave us some great advice. He said, uh, don't get in the music business. <laughs> You took that with a great. I was like, out. hey, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Don't get in the music business. Oh my god. I'm like, okay. That's I'm, fucking hilarious. I was, he, and he was right. I, I went to school, and then it got pulled me back in. God. I'm still on my gap year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah. I, I'm not going I, back. You never know. No, no, I know. No, I'm not going back. Yeah, fuck it. No, my, all my friends are doctors, and yeah. they're you know they have no fucking life. You know, I've never had a musical emergency. You know, like my phone rings. I got yeah. I got a musical emergency. Oh my god, I gotta it's go like, do uh, an overdub. You know, it's like go fucking. There's the cord. Look it up on Safari or something. <laughs> Leave me the fuck alone. Oh man. Well, I'm I'm uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you guys again. I have I don't think I've seen you guys since that um, that corporate gig, and that was probably around. Wow. I don't know, O two 2 or something, three, four. We were at the Garden last year. We played here two nights. Yeah, that's rad, right? I just saw Def Leppard Journey there. Just sold it out, no problem. The Garden is just such a, you walk on that stage and it's like, uh, oh, yeah. the ghosts of uh, rock and roll pass is unbelievable. Yeah, I've been touring with Bill Burr. Uh, all he's of, great. Yeah, and uh, we just did LA Forum. He did, I opened. But he's doing nice. the uh, Garden on November 7th. You should go to that. It's going to be mind-boggling, dude. To watch him do comedy in the garden is uh, it's next I level. I will. Yeah, come down, dude. Yeah, because uh, Gabby was working for Robert Kelly. Yep, yeah, that's how I met Gab. Yeah. Yeah. Through the man. So funny, man. He did his In the Shed show. I was up in the shed. <laughs> you, went, you slummed it up there, huh? I slummed it up there. <laughs> did you drive the Porsche? 
No, he sent a car. Oh, God, you should have drove that Porsche up I there. I probably should have. Just but whoop. it was funny. He sent a car, and then when I pulled up, Richard Voss, Voss yeah. was outside. Yeah. And it was like kind of like a 1-800. It was kind of a semi-shitty town car. Yeah. But I didn't really care. I was like, yeah, yeah. I didn't care. Ga my daughter was up there. Gabby was up there filming and, and, and working on the podcast. And uh, Voss goes, couldn't have got the guy a nicer car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just, of course, he's just going to rip him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know, but Bobby was probably like, do you got one a little cheaper? It's like, it looks the same, but maybe a little yeah, cheaper. <laughs> a couple dents on it. <laughs> no, it's great. Are you guys doing America at all? Uh, or what are you going to do? You, you toured the hell out of the new record. We toured. So last year, we, or this year, yeah. we did 30 shows. Yep. Already in America. That's all you need to do. And now we're going to do another six overseas. We're planning something. For next summer, we're, we're potentially going to go out again. We haven't announced it yet, but yeah. uh, we're going to go somewhere in the world we haven't been. And it's kind of like just like do 30, 35 yeah. shows and just do it. P until, pick uh, up the paper tour. Yeah. Picking up the paper just tour. Just have fun. Yeah. Go around the world, not kill ourselves. Yeah. You know? I got to see you guys again. You I got to I gotta, gotta, gotta get out there. Thanks for doing the show. You have uh, is any kind of social media yourself? I have uh, Twitter. Yeah. DB David Bryan at the Twitter. Okay. I'm uh, going to get on the Instagram soon. Yeah. Gonna, you gotta I got get the on Twitter there. first. Get on there, dude, and put I some am. pictures up in that fucking car. I got to come out to your place. You, you're invited. Yeah, I'm there. I got to see the keyboards. Oh, I'll get some pictures of that shit, the vintage cool. keys. And uh, maybe we'll uh, lay down a song on some tape. Yeah, yeah. I got that digital tape. Digital tape, uh, some hard drives. Exactly. And then drive the Porsche and eat some food. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's a deal. All right. Thank you so much for doing the show. Don't forget, guys, to subscribe to the podcast and also go out and check out the brand new Bon Jovi record. It's been out a while now, but uh, it's definitely got some great tracks on it. And uh, go see them anytime you can. Like I always say, uh, see these bands while they're out on the road still. See you guys. <laughs>